Greetings, everyone. This is First and Twenty Seventy Three with a classic strategy game from I think the '90s. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite games growing up. Uh, I definitely played it in high school, so it was definitely around in the '90s. Um, I bought this game. I remember buying this game at the video store at the mall. Yes, there used to be video game stores. I think there are maybe still a few out there today, but it was awesome. I remember I had one of the coolest boxes ever, and I just figured out how to record this uh, full screen wise on XSplit. So I am going to go ahead and give you guys the gift of classic strategy gaming imperialism. Uh, this is uh, based in the 19th century, early 19th century, which is a great time for uh, strategy game imperialism. Um, there are scenarios involved in this, and you can do tutorials, which I've never done tutorials, but you could do European scenarios involving France, 1820, uh, post-Napoleonic era, naval competition, uh, Germany is united here, and so is Italy by 1892. Uh, and then unification, or oh, you can do the unification move. This one's actually pretty fun, actually, because you can try to get Prussia and Otto von Bismarck and all that stuff. Or you can play as Sardinia, which is nigh on impossible. That's like one of the most impossible things. But I am actually playing as Sardinian Serenaria, where I've sacked Paris, but the British are really coming after me. But that's a whole story for another time. Um, these are all more tutorials. We're going to just back up out of here. Uh, sometimes the game does crash for me. I got this on God Galaxy. Um, because I don't know where the original <laughs> one is, but uh, sometimes that the scenarios have crashed on me a few times. So I'm just going to go ahead and generate a random world. Uh, I guess we're going to play on hard. Um, and uh, you can pick one of these countries. And you can name your country too. Which country do I want? Uh, let me just generate another random world. Oh, oh, oh. I'm just going to close my eyes, and now we're going to do this one. All right, I get it. I'm sticking with it. Uh, Realm 1, I can call it whatever I want. I'm gonna call it, um, Centurion. Centurion Empire. Oops. Right. There. Empire. The Centur- Nope, we can't do that, can we? Centurion. We'll call it Centurion. Okay, so, start. All right, first thing you have to do is select your city, and the city is important where you select it. Um, you can do it anywhere within your... The capital city is critical in the game. Um, and it has to be on the coast. That says access to sea. I guess you could also build it on a river. Uh, that's not a good spot. You need access to food. This would be a ton of food here, but even better might be access to some lumber resources early on. What do I got here? Mm. That looks kinda good. Or here, let's see. Four grain, two fruit, one meat source. That would be seven food and two lumber versus eight food and one lumber. Hmm. Local food can sustain uh, six healthy population, maximum age. Food early on is pretty important. Where would I build my transport depot, huh? All right, I'm taking too long to decide this. And then there's oil right there too. I'm gonna put it right here just to get the extra lumber. Okay, you got a newspaper that comes up every, uh, between every turn, which is pretty cool. This has upheaval in government ministries, important changes occurred, and basically just new ruler proclaimed. You see this every time. And here we go. Okay, there are multiple dynamics to this game, which I love. You have your uh, transport orders, you have your industry orders, you have your trade orders, and you have your diplomacy orders, as well as simply... Um, whatever you're doing on the map. Okay, and uh, so our empire looks, this is our, our Centurion Empire. There's a big desert here. Desert and swamps have potential for oil, but uh, oil doesn't come around until later on. So early on, we're actually going to be hurting here for some resources. There is cotton down there, which I should probably get my hands on somehow. 
Um, you start off with a prospector and an engineer. The engineer can help out a lot with the cotton. And if I build a port right around here, I'll get some fish. But more, ac more importantly, I'll have access to this river. And I think I can build another port somewhere down the river. And then build a train getting access to the cotton as well as horses and looks like meat so port there yeah that might be something we're gonna do but there's also a lot of food on our east coast and down this line here that'll be tough to access maybe we could get a rail line going down there so that stuff we'll have to consider uh, around your capital city you already have farms are set up and we have access to um, the forest here. What the heck? I, the prospector. The prospector is important. <clears throat> Once there is oil discovered, uh, they'll be able to look for oil in the swamps and the deserts. But right now, we're going to have to focus on searching for uh, minerals from the hills and the mountains. And there you can find uh, four different resources. Iron, or iron, coal, or uh, gold or gems. All right, now let me go into the transport uh, menu. Now, transport menu is how much you are going to be transporting into your capital. Again, everything is going to be flowing into your capital. Uh, all the resources, you want to have all the resources flow into your capital, and you'll be shipping all the finished products out. So with the whole imperialist process, how it works. There are going to be resources, okay? And uh, our capacity is basically full. This is our capacity. We can bring in 15. Uh, we're transporting in nine, all right, from our from our hinterland, okay? This is all just the neighboring areas outside of our capital city. So this, this is basically set. We can't do much more this turn. Uh, I should build more infrastructure to gain access to more resources, but here, uh, this actually will probably explain it the best. Okay, so you have these natural resources that you can bring in like cotton, wool, timber, iron, and coal, and of course food. Cotton and wool can create fabrics. Fabrics can create clothes, and then you can sell the clothes. You can sell anything on the open market, but the finished products here, clothes, furniture, hardware, and arms, these will get you the most money on the market. These are uh, processed materials like fabric, paper, lumber, and steel, which you use your natural resources to create. And then these processed materials can be turned into these other things. Now, in order to do this, however, we need to build up our uh, industry. So, uh, we build up the industry, like for example, here is our steel mill and the steel mill requires uh, work of two units of labor here's your labor over here so I have uh, let me back that up a little bit and I'll go over the labor too you have untrained workers which count as one arm trained workers which will count as two arms and then expert workers which will count as four arms you can train your workers here for paper and cash there's the whole breakdown there okay uh, you can turn one of your untrained workers into a trained worker for paper and a hundred. Here it's a little more expensive, you get the expert workers. Okay, um, and then you can also train your workers to be uh, laborers that you're going to have outside the city, such as the prospectors, the engineers that we already have. This is a farmer, improves grain, fruit, cotton production. Miners uh, will open up mines for minerals, such as, like I said, coal, iron, gems, or gold. And there will be other workers that come along later. Foresters, oil drillers, a bunch of different people, but that will come along with new technology. All right. So, uh, first thing you have to do is go ahead and get these mills produced. And then, of course, there's factories that will follow. So, here we go. Uh... Steel mill capacity will be at two for the cost of building two steel and two lumber. And again, uh, you can take two laborers, one coal, one iron to create the steel here. And that's the capacity. We're going to go ahead and build these up. We're going to do the same thing with the textile mill. 
All right. Um, it's a little more flexible with the textiles. Uh, you need one iron and one coal for one steel. But here you just need two things. And it could be two cotton, two wool. I think it'd be one of each, too. I'm not sure if that's... I'm not sure if that's true. This is a little bit more flexible, though. But we'll go ahead and get that going. Uh, and then, of course, this is going to be our bread and butter right away because we have two timber coming in, and we'll be using that right away to make lumber. Lumber, again, can be turned... Or, yeah, timber. Timber can be turned into lumber or paper. So that's our whole mill production. And as time goes on, you're going to want to expand the mills, make them even bigger. You also need the factories. We might as well go ahead and grab these factories right away. You want to get these things operational as soon as possible. Um, don't need to really hold on to these reserves uh, yet. The other thing you need to worry about is the rail yards. Rail yards will increase your transport capacity. And you need that to do it, but we have plenty of transport capacity available, as we saw on the transport order screen. And then there's also the shipyard. Well, we saw the warehouse. The shipyard is important for two reasons. You build up your navy with warships, frigates, or ships with a line. These are the requirements. Okay, or this is the cost. This is what's available. So I can't really build any warships yet, because I don't have any guns. But merchant marine might be a good idea. Um... Especially early on, early on, but I'm gonna come back to that. So that's the shipyard, and then there's also food processing. We don't have any food yet, but we'll be bringing in food. Back to the transport order. This will tell you up here what is needed. So you need one food. We're bringing in one meat. We're bringing in one meat. We need two fruits. We're bringing in two fruits, and we need four grain, and we're bringing that in right now. All right, so that's all happening. So we're good with that. Uh, we're not gonna get any surplus yet. But again, I'm going to need to invest in infrastructure and expand my capacity there. Um, and it looks like I'm not really doing any workers. In the capital, you can increase the amount of workers with additional food, clothing, and furniture that will give you one untrained worker. Okay, so that is the uh, industrial breakdown. The third screen is the trade order. Okay, now with trade, trade is a very important uh, role this game. Now, we will not be able to bring in a whole bunch of trade right away because this is our merchant marine. We can only bring in four. So on the first turn, we're not going to be able to bring a lot of stuff in. I'm actually going to... You can offer things for sale, and you can lower the quantity. I'm going to go ahead and lower the quantities of this just in case I want to buy some things that are available on the market. And when you buy, uh, there are four things you can bid on. You only bid on four, okay? And since we have timber... I guess the best thing would be to bid on, and there you go, you can't bid on anything else. We got timber coming in, so bidding on wool, cotton, cotton wool, iron, and coal. These might be actually more important right away because uh, they're critical for the steel production. Anyways, let's go back here, and I think it's a good idea to increase our, my merchant marine. And an Indiaman gives me four cargo versus a trader that gives me two. But two, but an Indiaman is cheaper. So two traders would give me four cargo, but it would cost me two fabrics and eight lumber, as opposed to an Indiaman, which costs me three fabrics and seven lumber, which is good right away. These are large vessels are slow, incapable of defending themselves against a ship of line or a frigate, which doesn't really matter right away because you're not at war, but later on, you may want to diversify your fleet a little bit because if one of these, a lot of your big transports get sunk, you could have pretty devastation, devastating effects on your total transport. Um, of course, this does have better armor than the trader. There will be other options that come along too. Again, with more technology, I'm going to save my resource, conserve my resources and maximize my capacity with a new Indian Min that we're going to produce right away and that will double uh, double my transport capacity and on the next turn I'll have eight so that's a nice thing so those are all the basic management things that I can, that I can go over with you guys right now the fourth screen is more of the grand strategy screen here is the map okay and the color countries are great powers and in the game you are pretty much competing for um, the vote from the Council of Governors. And if someone gets more than 50% of the vote from the Council of Governors, they automatically win. All right, and each province gets a vote. 
right away not a lot of people are going to be voting empire states will probably vote major power states will vote for themselves okay so the colored ones again are major powers these are minor powers minor powers can become colonies you can conquer them if you want but you can also you can conquer them with military force but you can also conquer them diplomatically as well so if we take a look here is the treaties map so this is the political map okay and it will tell you number of provinces and who their most favored trading partner is so it would be cool if we had one but I do not see that I have a favorite trading partner right no no okay so no favorite trading partners for me all other people for me and you can uh, click on different ones and they'll tell you where the situations where their treaties exist okay and basically these are the types of treaties you can have you either be a peace or at war you could also have a non-aggression pact, an alliance, or this could be an extension of your empire if it's purple. All my empire is purple. Additionally, there are trade consulates and embassies. Trade consulates are good because they allow you to offer subsidies, and there are no subsidies being offered by me or really anybody yet. But if you go into this tab, these are different... Uh, Subsidies that can be offered through trade policies. You can also boycott and you can do colonial boycott if anyone has colonies um, but Right away there aren't any colonies. So again, that's the treaties map. I don't I just have embassies with all of the um, Current great powers and embassies do allow you to move stuff into their land move uh, some of those outside workers into the land all great powers start with eight provinces, while all minor powers start with four. And this will tell you your industry and military strength, which is good right now. Go from country to country, and I guess everyone is pretty much good at a starting point. This screen will talk about foreign grants, but it also tells you the opinion. Uh, right now everyone is neutral, but uh, green is good, brown is bad, and it will vary across time. As you move minor powers closer to green, when they become green, then you can offer to bring them into the empire and annex them. For starters, though, uh, the best thing to do is to build trade consulates on the first turn. I like to do at least two, maybe three, depends on your scenario. I think the game suggests one, no more than two in the manual, but three sometimes is a good deal. Depends on your situation. Now, find out what we, who we want to be our trading partners. We're going to go into the minor... Uh, states here. I'm thinking these guys because they're pretty close, but I don't need these are the major exports. I don't need timber. Kessel. See, this who man, this guy is close, and I could actually just invade them and take it over. Kessel is probably a pretty good one to have. This one stinks because there's only one export. Zazi and Cafe are bordering these two, and I'm assuming that that could lead to war. Now, if a major power does declare war on a minor power, and I think if you have an embassy with them, then they might ask you for your aid, and then they will automatically become your colony, which is pretty good. But let's see. Right now, Deneb is competing for Twilt, which does make them... A danger so conquering them might not be the best move I think I like Kessel we could really be importing a lot of uh, cotton and wool with these two guys and they're pretty close to our borders so I think I want that's also a pretty good one. They're too far away to defend. Twelve is close, and we could defend them if somebody attacks. And right now, you can see that Deneb has a big advantage. There are also minor powers around them, and if you attack one of these minor powers, uh, it could have a negative effect on neighboring minor powers. This is behind, but they're really good. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and open up consulate here, consulate here. We'll compete over that one. Alright, so two consulates will be opened right away. 
And as for this guy, and that cost us $500 each. Um, I am going to move him. Should I move him or should I just start moving with the train tracks? I'm going to keep him put for now. And that's going to be that. And we're going to save him some cash just in case we want to buy stuff. Okay, so that's the basic overview of the orders phase of the game. And now we'll go into switching turns. And that means, oh, okay, so the engineer right here can build a depot, or, which will be important. Rail lines, right there, you can see that cursor is a rail line, uh, can, be, can connect depots with uh, the capital city. Ports will connect capital city via C. And I think with rivers, I don't know if you need, I can't remember if you need a port at the end of the river for access. I think you do. You can also build a fort to build up your defenses. And you have military units, of course, too. Militia, regular infantry, heavy infantry, heavy artillery, and there's a ton of other units. By the way, I did mention that there is different technology. Right now we have sea drill and high pressure steam engine. You always start with that. And these are the benefits of those technologies. Uh, as time goes on, more technologies will become available. You will have to purchase them in order to benefit from them, though. So, that is the orders phase. And here we go into the second phase of the game, which is the trading phase. Okay, and right now... And you can go and you can check out the trade books to see who's offering what. And Kessel was one and twelve. So those were two... And you can see the nations that are bidding, and the nations that are offering. And Kessel is offering two wool, which means that I should hold off for that deal. Nobody is offering iron or coal right away because it's not developed. So instead of buying from them, I'm going to reject this bid, reject that bid, Reject that bid, and this is Kessel. This is the one I have a trade consulate with, and this purchase is recommended. We have a trade consulate with them, thus each trade improves relations with them. Industry does not need more wool. Uh, merely purchase one unit would bring diplomatic benefits. We're going to buy both of them, and we're going to prevent other people from trading with them. So this gains a monopoly on it. Boom. And that's your trade turn. And this is your books. So, um... These offers were denied, and this is the offer you went through. It costs 98 per wool, but the clothing that will eventually be developed is got a sale of 846, and furniture 924. So obviously the finished goods are much more valuable than these resources. All right. So the whole idea is you buy the resources from the minor colonies, minor states, forge them into. Um, intermediate goods and finished goods and then sell the finished goods on the final market okay and so the sale bottom line we have a sale of 1770 we bought 196 and our military upkeep was 100 this will give us a $1400 profit and they also have a credit limit which means you can go over by that much before something bad happens that I've never really gone that far so I don't really know what happens so whew, that was a mouthful um, and here we go. This is the next turn. Okay, we have a new unit reporting for duty. One Indian increasing our merchant marine capacity to eight. And the main article, these are just random articles that are funny uh, in general. They relate to things historically, so it's pretty cool. Um, and it kind of, I guess if you do read them the first time, it will tell you a little bit about what's going on in the game. A lot of the stuff is, some of the stuff is just jokes, but it's, it's historical, so it's cool. If it's in bold, it's an actual headline of something that really happened that matters in the game. And as you see, Centaurian, me, went on a consulate spree. Okay, so we've met the, business, the busy Ministry of Trade has managed to open up trade consulates in nations of Kessel and 12 excited merchants see this as an age of opportunities, while political analysts claim Centaurian is merely trying to increase its influence over other parts of the globe. Both are true, and we just got a nice win there. Oh, yeah. We just found coal. That is going to be great 
for our industry. So, what I want to do now is I do want to make a port right here. I can't connect through railroads. I can't build through currently for infrastructure. Ah, I can't click on them. Okay, I can't, um, I won't be able to build railroads from, I won't be able to connect railroads there. Since I have the surrounding tiles, it's not really a benefit of me to build a rail line. But I think if I go right here and build a port, I can get access to these cotton fields and get access to the coal mines in the hills. I will have uh, the fruit orchards here and I will gain meat from the sea. So I think this is a very good spot. I'm going to move him there and there's a possibility that there could be another resource here but most, most likely not because of uh, they're not, it's kind of sparse. Usually most of the tiles you look under will not have a resource but we can take a shot and maybe just maybe we'll get really lucky and we have something there too but it, regardless this is a nice place to expand our infrastructure bringing in a lot more food uh, cotton and coal so it will be time we have six I may even want to try to expand that a little bit um, and now all our mills and factories are set up so we can take a look at uh, our warehouse. I'm going to probably sell another clothing and furniture on the market. Uh, I have wool that came in, so with that wool, I can go ahead and take two of my workers and turn more fabric, create more fabric. No cost other than labor and the resource. Same thing with lumber here. We've got two timber that will give us one extra lumber. I cannot expand my railroad at all because I don't have any timber. Um, I could start to produce something in the metalworks. I definitely can produce more clothing. I think I want to do that um, just to get this whole clothing market going because you need to get some finished goods. You need to be producing these finished goods to keep making money and make a profit. I like to get a nice big surplus. That's really nice and really fun. So the next question is, do I use the steel or do I hold on to the steel? And I think for now I might just hold on to it uh, just to see what's going on. So that'll leave six people open, so I'm not using six. So, you know, one thing I could do is go to the trade school and turn some of these guys into trained workers, which will increase my capacity. Which, why not? Get at least two. Now you don't want to. You do want to keep a balance here too. You don't want to have everyone stacked in uh, expert. Because you go into the armory here when you recruit units. Some of these units require unskilled labor. Okay. Those are trained labor. Those are grenadiers. A little bit more advanced infantry. These are the regular infantry. Sharpshooters have much good, much better range on their weapons. Range of five. Oh, I guess it's the same. What the heck? They have more movement. Okay. Uh, and yeah, the more advanced units are more expensive. Sappers uh, will, dil will dig tunnels underground. That's entrenchment right there. Those are those are valuable for attacking forts. Heavy artillery is kind of critical. Uh, very de devastating. Field artillery is interesting because it can fire on the move, but it's not as devastating as heavy artillery. And these cavalry can be valuable as well. Uh, as special units, but the mainstay unit is going to be the regular infantry. But we're not worried about that right away because um, the market, uh, because we're not at war with anybody. Okay, so I'm going to keep the trade policy, uh, the border trade orders set as it is, and into diplomacy, I probably want to set up another consulate. I was thinking maybe there. Ooh, cafe is nice. Is anybody... Oh, wow. Sindel has a lot of resources, huh? I'm going to keep it at two for now. And we will try to compete. Eh, 
Yeah, I'll try to compete with two. Now, in order to uh, win over our colonies and make them make you, uh, there we go. Quetzal, our favorite uh, trading favorite trading nation, is Centurion because of that uh, wool trade. So that that helped out. But we still don't have twelfth. Twelfth is still uh, still has Deneb Deneb as their favorite trading partner. So we want to win them over, and we have to check out subsidies now. They are offering 5% subsidies, which means that they will pay 5% more for the resources and the finished goods will be 5% less. When it becomes your colony, that will flip towards your advantage. Our industry is awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and offer subsidies. And I'm going to go ahead and offer big subsidies, 10%. Boom, boom. Let's grab them. Okay, and that's that for this turn. I'm going to need a miner here. Well, let's go ahead and end this turn and run through another trade cycle. We now have a greater merchant marine. We only sold one. We know we had a eight because I bought that Indian man. My merchant marine is up to eight. And you see the profits array. The sales go through first. Now, Prom, Pram, sorry, is not uh, someone we're actually gunning for. But we can go into the books again and see who's offering what. Twelfth is offering. But Deneb gets the first bid. So Pram, the first bid went to Ordon, Issa. So Centurion, we weren't, we were the last offer to everybody. Except for 12, we would have been second. But Deneb bought it, bought the cotton. Let's check out the wool. Why are we not the first for Kessel? Because we were their favorite. I don't know why that's happening. Also, that one and that one. We're not worried about either one of them. Hmm. I got a lot of room, so I might just buy this cotton. Really? Did we not get Kessel? Are they not our favorite trading partner? Uh, I'm going to buy up the coal. And sometimes it's better early on to just buy up as many resources as possible. Because they can be turned into... Finished goods very cheaply. Oh my god, we found gold. Oh my god, that is huge. Huge. I've gone over 30 minutes and I wanna I don't wanna go too far in these episodes. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Um feel free to post down below, let me know what you think. And I think I really love this game. It's one of my favorite strategy games of all time. And I really want to do a series for you guys. I hope. There's no copyright things going on there. Um, but please post and like the video. Let me know if you want to see more. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.